in search of soil. So Kelby, you know, prior to getting into biochar, what were you doing at the time? Oh, a variety of things. Um, I have a degree in mechanical engineering. And uh, so, you know, I've always been interested in renewable energy. But I was making my living uh, just prior to biochar as a journalist, environmental journalist. And before that, I had spent like 15 years working in the forest protection movement in the Pacific Northwest. So I was uh, I was the director of an organization called the Siskiyou Regional Education Project here in Southern Oregon. And we, you know, we led hikes. We tried to let people know about the federal lands and that they were still being logged for the old growth trees and promoted legislation and lawsuits and, the, you know, the whole gamut of stuff, too. I was a forest protection activist. Um and also, um, for the last 30 years, I've, I've been living in a small, you know, rural community, uh, growing my own food as much as I can. You know, when it comes to biochar, what was the aha moment for you that you said, hey, I, I need to pay attention to this, whether that was through journalism and eventually becoming somebody who researches it, who really promotes it, who's done a lot of work advancing it? What was the, the moment that really sent you off on that journey? I think it was in 2006 that I first heard about it, and I heard about it from, um, it was just in the news. You know, soil scientists had discovered this, uh, these dark um, soils in the Amazon that were completely unexpected. They were not natural. They were apparently made by humans, and they were just learning about it and exploring it and uh, learning about the agri agronomic implications of it. And I came across that. I was writing uh, for a, an online news service called Truth Out at the time. I was their environmental editor. I came across that store, a couple stories, and I just, this is interesting. So I'm looking into it more and more, and I, um, you know, I wanted to write more stories about it, but I, you know, it was hard to find anything that was actually happening. So I, uh, but there was a conference coming up in Australia in 2007. And it was the first, uh, at that time they called it the International Agrochar Conference. And I, I begged one of my editors to let me go <laughs> there and cover that story. And they did, you know, they paid, paid me to go there. Um, so I met a lot of Australians. I met the, the soil scientists and there was a big interest from the climate um, community too. The climate change scientists were there because they could immediately see the implications of this for climate where you could start creating a pump, a biotic pump that would remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, build it into plant tissues. And then if, in, you know, instead of letting those plant tissues go through their normal decay process or go through a wildfire, uh, where all the carbon dioxide, almost, you know, 99% of the carbon dioxide goes back to the atmosphere. I mean, that's good. That's the natural carbon cycle. But if we could grow some excess biomass and char that, then we could put that in the ground and not only would it sequester carbon, but it would also boost, um, you know, the carbon sequestration, further carbon sequestration by further plant growth. So that's a, what you call a virtuous cycle. And uh, it, it's like a pump. You could pump carbon dioxide out of the air and into the ground where it could do a lot of good. So that really caught my imagination because I was all about climate at that point, you know, very alarmed about it. It worked for years protecting old growth forests. And then I could see, wow, forest health is plummeting. You know, um, if we don't do something about climate, uh, drought and heat, we're going to lose these forests that I just spent decades of my life trying to protect. So that was one um, big impetus for, to get involved in it. And the other one was just personal, you know, being a gardener and spending a lot of time hauling manure and trying to build soil I kind of looked at it, I thought, this is like permanent compost. And I went, wow. <laughs> so immediately, that's why I immediately started going hands on with it. Yeah, I think a lot of people have similar stories. You know, that Terra Preta, Amazonian soils, it really draws a lot of people in. You know, being involved in this and for almost 15 years, coming at it from a journalist background, now a practitioner background. When you look at the total stuff written about biochar today, from the from the most scientific and legit to the claims, do you think that 
what's being said and talked about biochar helps the biochar movement or or hampers it like a lot of media mainstream media i mean we see this today there's a lot of spin there's a lot of pushing agendas there's a lot of maybe not revealing all the facts and just kind of skewing stories in the direction we want i come at this from a, as a healthy skeptic you know like i i use biochar i want more about it but i read some stuff on biochar and sometimes it just makes me cringe when i read it what are your thoughts on that well it's been a, it's been an interesting journey you know i started working with this the soil scientists and the climate scientists so after i came back from that conference um I just wanted to do more stories about it, so uh, but I couldn't see a lot of stories, and I was like, I need to do this full time. So I contacted the group that had organized the conference, which was now called the International Biochar Initiative, and I said, I do communications. Can I help you? And they hired me. So for four years, I worked for the International Biochar Initiative, and I worked very closely with the, the top scientists internationally um, on communications and you know developing information on the website. And then the, the last big project I did for them was um, biochar characterization standards documents. So this was a multi-stakeholder process where we just tried to find out what is, you know, what is important to know about biochar because number one thing you need to know about biochar is it's not just one thing. Okay, it's carbonized biomass, charcoal, comes in many different forms. It depends on what it's made from, the temperature it's made from, the other minerals and other constituents in it, the amount of ash. It's all going to have really different impacts. So I think that's a lot of the reason why there's a confusion and out there about biochar because some it'll work in some some biochar will work here and it won't work there. You know, and, it, and so you, you need a lot better information on actually how to use it, what your application is. Did you do a soil test? Do you know what your soil needs? You know, because it's not just carbon. There's ash and, and other, you know, there's pH con considerations. So it's, you know, it's just not one thing. It's like saying fertilizer. Is it good or is it bad? You know? <laughs> right, right. Yeah. It's soil carbon. That's it. And I know from talking to Gloria Flora, that was one of her big frustrations around this was she'd read studies and they would come to results that maybe weren't favorable in terms of biochar. And she would talk to the people who did the studies and they weren't even really sure what type of biochar they were starting with, what temperature it was made from, what the structure was, those types of things. And and she's kind of like, well, for a lot of studies like that, yeah. I think they're getting better now. And there's some really interesting results now coming out of um um, Iowa State researchers there are finding that when you add, and this is just on soil carbon, when you add biochar to soil over long-term studies now, they've, you know, there were no long-term studies. Now we have more long-term studies that um, in six years, the soil carbon doubled beyond what the biochar contributed. So it had a, a, a stimulating effect to increase soil carbon. So strictly from a climate standpoint, that's really important. But there are, um, you know, things you can do to make biochar work, little tricks of the trade, and that's what people need to know. And yes, there are a lot of home experimenters out there. There are people just like me, you know, who love to tinker around and play with stuff. And biochar is perfect for that. I just got done uh, teaching a, a three-day day camp for middle school kids all about biochar. You know, it was a, science, a STEM camp, science, technology, engineering, and math. We did a little art project. Um, and, um, you know, it's, it's endless what you can learn, you know, citizen science about biochar. It's so fun, easy to do. Anybody can do it. In fact, you know, people have done for millennia, put charcoal in soils, not just in the Amazon, also in Africa, there are extensive uh, places where there are uh, terra preta like soils and even in Europe, you know, um, one of the original researchers who um, looked at terra preta soils was a, a Dutch um, researcher, scientist, um, Sombrek was his name. And he talked about what he called plogen soils in, in, um, in the Netherlands, which were black soils that were made from refuse. You know, people use people use biomass for heat and power. And often when you have a fire, you have little chunks of charcoal in it. 
And so they would use that to sanitize their other organic waste, whether it's human waste or, you know, food waste or anything like that. And they'd have refuse areas. And those ended up being the fertile soils. You know, it all happened the same way, I think, in a lot of places in the world. And then people realize, some people realize, oh, this is what we're doing. And we could do it deliberately and get more of these soils. So these plogging soils, they call them in the Netherlands, um, were the, during World War II, there was food shortages everywhere. And he said his family survived from, because of the plogging soils on their farm. And if they hadn't had that, they wouldn't, they would have starved. So these black soils are everywhere. The other thing that convinced me early on that this is real and we need to look at it was natural biochar. So if you look at the soils in Iowa, they're called mollusols. They're similar to the soils in the Ukraine, the richest agricultural soils in the world. And what makes them that way? What makes them that way is they were their step, their step grassland areas. And so they're prairie fires. They come through naturally, you know, in a cycle of every 10 years or so, or maybe more frequent, I don't know. And what happens is those tall, tall, tall prairie grasses, a fire flashes through, burns off the top part of the gases, and the heat goes, radiates down, you know, into the where the roots all bunch, you know, where the, the base of those bunch grasses and chars that. And but then then the fire moves on, so it, it goes out before it turns to ash. So you make a lot of char that way by burning a prairie. And um, so there's half of the carbon in Iowa soils is charcoal from past prairie fires. Yeah, the stories are just they're really interesting in looking at these natural examples and, and then trying to implement those in a human made system, I, I think is is where we're at now. If you look at Starting with working with some scientists at the beginning, knowing that we have longer term studies right now, what are kind of some of the bullet points of where we're at now from the science side of things? Because a lot of people are always like, you know, pound in the table, show me the science, show me the science. So given today with biochar research, where do you think are kind of the unquestionable or, or more or less scientific knowns at this point based upon work over the past few decades? Let's see if I could summarize it. Um, char itself, the, you know, we want to know what the mechanisms are. What makes it what makes it do the things that it's claimed to do? Uh, keeping in mind that I won't do the same things in every situation, but um, I think the the I always talk about three things that it provides to microbes. So it provides housing. So it's got you've got all this surface area. And it's, um, you know, got pores at every scale. So it's got macro pores because you take wood and, or even straw or something and you char it. The, the vascular structure and the cellular structure is preserved in that char. And so all the, the carbon atoms link up when you char it and make a very strong, I mean, it's brittle, but in some ways it's strong in that it can't be broken down by microbes easily. And so you have all these little, you know, cell walls and, and vascular pores and stuff. So it's very porous. And then you even have, um, you know, nano porosity. And that's just because of the way the carbon atoms kind of, the molecules kind of jumble up. Um, if you ever heard of carbon nanotubes, I mean, it, so there's, there's also a whole nother realm of applications for biochar that have to do with um, material science. So char is being used in uh, electronics, you know, um, as electricity conductor. It's being used to um, block um, um, infrared uh, radiation and even, um, you know, the uh, like microwave radiation because it has these really interesting electrical properties. So it's it's, it's two things: it's porosity. With surface area, all those surfaces are electrically active. Um, so it's so that's what gives it cation exchange capacity, for instance. And also, um, it has this impact on microbes where it um, it promotes better, more efficient metabolism by something that's called uh, diet direct interspecies electron transfer. 
So, um, so it gives them a place to live. So surface area, because microbes like to, they say they like to sit down when they eat they, so they can attach to something. And when they're sitting on this surface, that's got these electrical properties because a carbon, aromatic carbon ring, you know, a carbon molecule in char looks like a, a hexagon, it's a six sided ring. And, um, that's what they call a benzene ring because it's really the basis of so much organic chemistry, right? So it's the uh, uh, and and the pe- the guy who first di- discovered it discovered it as part of benzene, which is one aromatic carbon ring with some other stuff on it. I don't remember the formula for it. And um, that's an interesting story. His name was Kekulé. This was back in the eight, late eighteen hundreds. And he was trying to figure out the structure of this carbon. And he had a dream about the Ouroboros, which is the snake that eats its own tail. And he woke up the next morning. He said, that's it. That what's happening with that ring is the electrons are free to circulate around it. So that's what gives us the electrical properties. So you have sheets and sheets of this stuff in the biochar. Some of you, some people may have heard of graphene. That's another kind of high-tech nanomaterial. They're making um, graphene tubes, and and they just have really interesting electrical, like semiconductor type properties. Um, so so yes, yeah, so that those free electrons are there for microbes, and microbes can live on the surfaces, and they can um, access access those electrons because in their met- metabolism. Sometimes they need an electron to complete a reaction, you know, a, tr- a metabolic reaction. And um, when they're, and sometimes they need to give one up. And so when they're on this substrate that is conductive and has free electrons, they can not only improve their metabolic efficiency, but they can also um, ex- more easily exchange electrons with other microbes. So you get increased diversity. And we all know that, you know, biological diversity is is how we get health, right? You, whether it's in our bodies or in the environment. So I would say, you know, one of the main things that biochar does is it promotes microbial life and microbial diversity. And you get more stable, more resilient soils from that. And a lot of people listening to this, so that's what they're after when it comes to char. They're gardeners, they're homesteaders, they're farmers, and in the soil either fuels them internally because it's something that they enjoy or it's literally their livelihood. Uh, looking at your work and thinking about projects that you've done over the years, can you talk about some some stories or examples where you've seen agricultural soils really change with the addition of char? So um, I'm a gardener and an experimenter. And I'm not a commercial farmer. Um, I certainly see my garden soil change a lot. And I could talk about how, what changes I've observed. Um, uh, There are some people who are starting to use biochar in broad scale agriculture. There certainly are people who are using it in um, horticulture, um, specifically, you know, vineyards, cannabis, um, nut and fruit trees, blueberries, things like that. I don't have personal experience with those. Yeah. Well, even on I, a gar- garden scale would be great. Just stuff yeah. that you've seen. Well, one of the projects, the, the biggest project that I have done with that involved other people was um, a conservation innovation grant from the NRCS. And we got that grant in 2015. And we spent three years uh, working with um a, a, a group of enthusiasts and also a group of small farmers to do biochar experiments. But the whole focus of our grant was not on like long-term field studies. We did some pot trials. We did do a couple of field trials, which are very difficult to do, but mostly we were looking at how to use biochar to manage manure. So that's the conclusion I came to quite a while ago is that when you take charcoal straight out of a kiln, it's, it's not alive. It's a mineral. You know, it's not a bio, it's not a biological entity. It's just, it's a mineral. And it, and it can have some interesting effects when you just, if you just add a lot of it right to soil, straight out of the kiln, it's the sponge. So it starts absorbing things, right? 
and it can temporarily tie up nitrogen just by absorbing it. It can also temporarily tie up nitrogen if it has, you know, there's always two, there's, there's several fractions in each char. The way you characterize it is you frac, it's by fractions. So you have a fraction of stable carbon, which is, you know, what we think of as the char. Then you have a fraction of labile carbon, which is, um, you know, carbon that's not completely charred. It might be an oily kind of uh, material, still has hydrogen and oxygen in it. That's micro food. Microbes can eat that. And then you have ash. So those are the three main fractions, and ash is just the minerals, right? When you burn all the carbon out, you're just left with this white powder, which is the ash. So that labile carbon, some chars have quite a lot of that. And if you put that in soil, then it's like adding sawdust. You know, so you get the microbial bloom where the microbes go, oh, wee, carbon. Now, where's the nitrogen? And so they start robbing all the nitrogen and, again, temporarily tying up nitrogen. So that, a lot of people got bad results from char just because they didn't know how to use it. They dumped a whole bunch of it right in the soil. Like the first researchers, um, soil scientists even, they looked at the terra preta soils and they said, oh, there's 10 tons per hectare, 10 to 20 tons per hectare of char in these soils. Let's try that. So they dumped 10 to 20 tons per hectare of char in a field and they get bad results, you know. And they're like, <laughs> what did we do? Created all at once. It was created a little bit at a time and it was mixed with other organics. So the secret to using biochar is put it in the compost first. It's really simple. Anyway, so we, we did a lot of experiments that really showed that, I think, pretty well with our project. And so um, we worked with about a dozen small farmers. Um, and the, the idea was to... So we're in Oregon, so these are all farmers mostly who had some wood, woody debris, you know, timberland or slash piles. We're always trying to deal with um, falling branches, dead trees, you know, their fuels problem for for us because, you know, we have forest fires. So because they're doing all this work anyway to manage this woody debris and usually putting it in a burn pile that they light off and it's smoky and, you know, not nice. So we built, we designed and built kilns, you know, what we call the Oregon kiln, which is this pyramid kiln, and then another one called the Ring of Fire kiln, which is just a cylinder. And we really, I think, perfected some techniques for mm -hmm. making char in these kilns. And then we take the char and, um, you know, we'd use it in, in um, animal barns. So we had a goat dairy, and they would sprinkle the char on top of the bedding once a week. And noticeable improvements in odors, um, far less ammonia. Um, animals seem to be healthier. They're not exposed to that ammonia. And then the, uh, the other thing is that the, the pack, the manure pack, which in a goat dairy, you know, they're not cleaning it out every day. They're right. cleaning it maybe two, three times a year. And um, whereas before they'd have to wear a respirator when they dug into that because the ammonia was so intense. Now it's compost, it's composting in place, much healthier for the animals. And so that's, you know, if you have any kind of animals at all, that's where you should start using your biochar. And then it cascades through the system. I mean, this is a perfect permaculture item because it's your stacking functions all the way. Yeah, and you have some great white papers on this at wilsonbiochar.com. And I, I read that and I'm like, oh, that's a great idea of, of putting it into the bedding. And that's something I started doing in my chicken coop. I had all this biochar around too. I'm like, what am I going to do with all this? Like, I don't really have anywhere else to put it in the soil right now. So I just started adding it to the chicken coop. It does seem it absorbs, you know, chicken manure is very liquid. So it, the biochar wants to soak it up. Uh, it's less bedding I'm buying. It does take the smell. And We've also had a problem with a cat box lately, and now I'm thinking, okay, I'm going to start adding it to my cat box is just another way to to pick up some of that ammonia smell. So I, I love that aspect of it. Um, when, when you look at the soils, one thing that I find interesting is, is this fractional analysis, and, and you worked on some of this grading project for of, of how biochar was classified. In a perfect world, like if I was going to create a, a lab and a machine to make the best biochar for soil amendments, do you want the majority of that char to be stable carbon with the least amount of labial carbon and least amount of ash possible? 
Um, well, it does depend on your objective, but, um, yes, I, I've come to the conclusion that the high temperature chars are definitely easier to use. So that's the, 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 okay. Now there's a difference between, this is really easy. I think for people to understand the difference between the biochar that we make at high temperature in a flame, the flame cap kilns. Um, there are other processes too, like gasifiers or even um, most of the char that's made commercially these days is made in biomass power plants in a in a furnace. So it's actually made. There's a lot of misconceptions about what pyrolysis is. Mm -hmm. you know, pyrolysis being the process for making char. So you can make char in a retort that's an enclosed vessel that's externally heated. You have a little more control over that sometimes. Um, or you can make it in a flame and you just adjust the process so that um, you save the char. So you use the flame to get the gas out of it and burn the gas. And then once you finish that first stage, you know, then, then you um, remove the char essentially from the air. Um, so those are two processes and I've got webinars on my website that people can look at if they want all the details, technical details about how those work. Um, but the flame process is always a high temperature process. It's always going to be about a thousand degrees centigrade. Um, whereas a retort process can be much lower temperature because it's basically an oven and you can turn it up any temperature you want. You're, you're applying the heat externally and that's how barbecue charcoal is made or fuel charcoal. So it's made, um, um, well, it's actually a little bit of a hybrid process that I won't go into, but it's made at low temperature and by cutting off air. And um, so there's a lot of tar and oil in that stuff. And that is great for fuel because it gives you more energy to burn to cook your steak or whatever. But it's, and it can be good for soil it does have that problem of the microbial bloom because of the labile carbon. And it can also have some kind of toxic stuff that can suppress plant growth. It can also have some really interesting chemicals though. So for instance, one of the uh, byproducts of some charcoal making processes is something called wood vinegar. So that's a condensate. So you take the smoke, basically the wet smoke from the first part of the burn where you're still, you know, um, taking water off and you condense that and you get this aqueous, you know, liquid. So you get these water soluble chemicals. It's about 5% uh, acetic acid. So it's like pH about 1.5, I think, or two. And it's, um, it's got um, all like, all these chemicals that are growth stimulants. Mm. So think about what happens after a, a fire, a forest fire. You see that new growth coming back really quickly. Part of that is because of those smoke chemicals, their growth stimulate, stimulants. So some people are actually capturing that and selling that for, um, you know, for an agricultural amendment, and it, it promotes Microbes eat it. Um, I think the, the chemical that, that promotes growth is called a keratin. Um, and then it can also, if you, if you dilute it at different strengths, it can be used um, as a pesticide. It's good for powdery mildew and um, other kinds of fun. It's a fungicide. So, you know, so they can have some benefit. Low temperature char can have some benefits. So it, you just need to understand it and what it does and how to use it and what you want to accomplish with your char. So a high temperature char is essentially a more pure char. And it's a higher carbon percentage. Yeah. A it. high temperature char is usually at least 75% up to 85 or even 90% pure carbon. And a lower temperature char might be 50% carbon. Um, and, yeah. Well, one of the concerns that I have had come up when people have, you know, heard me talk about it is they're like, you know, what about the process? Can it produce toxic compounds, dioxins, things like that? If you are burning at these higher temperatures, what are your thoughts on that? Are you going to end up with toxic compounds potentially in the char? No. Not really. 
I mean, there's a few circumstances where it can happen. Um, one thing that probably needs to be looked at is um, if the wood has a lot of salt in it, like if it was a uh, beech wood, you know, from the, the beach or if it had been, you know, near the ocean and I had salt spray, chlorine is a known precursor of dioxin. So you'd want to look at that. Um, but the, the, the high temperature processes generally dioxins may be created, but they're usually destroyed immediately. So there's, you know, it's really complicated. There's different pathways that can form dioxins. Um, you know, right now it's, I did a paper on it. Um, it's on the IBI website on dioxin formation. Um, and it's just, you know, it's not very likely that you're going to find any dioxins in, in, especially in the low tech kind of processes, some higher tech processes, maybe, but no, it's, you know, there is something called a PAH, a polyaromatic hydrocarbon. And there are, it's a whole class of chemicals and you'll find some of those in some biochars, but they are, um, first of all, most of them, are harmless. In fact, you know, biochar itself is a PAH, a polyaromatic hydrocarbon. So it's just, there's like 18 of them that are short chain, hydro, you know, um, molecules that, that can be toxic. And, you know, I think some of the lower temperature chars are more likely to have them than the high temperature chars. So, you know, we've the biochar that we make in kilns in open flame, you know, the flame gap kilns is, is very safe. In terms of controlling temperature of the burn, are the main factors in that moisture content in the wood when you start, the amount of available oxygen to get at the flame at the top, and how you're layering the pile along with like maybe size of material? Yeah. Yeah, that's pretty much it. You know, you don't want smoldering combustion. Smoldering combustion is cool. You want to keep a good hot flame there. It burns the smoke so you're not polluting the air as much. And it keeps the temperature high. Um, if you don't have a flame, then you're, you're, you're cooling down. Sure. What about in terms of feedstock? Let's say we burned and made biochar out of rice hulls. Uh, softwood like a pine and then something that burns really hot and hard like black locust. We're going to end up with char at the end of all those, assuming we manage the fire appropriately. What do you think is going to be the difference between those chars? Well, the, the wood chars mainly differ by density. So, um, you know, your black locust is probably more dense than your pine. Um, so it'll, it'll be different by density. That's the main thing. Cause if you cook it hard, hot, you know, all the, the other distinguishing chemistry of the wood species is going to be cooked away, burned away in the flame. So your, you mean your goal is to get the carbon, uh, you, the ash content will be different. You know, you'll have, cause different species will have different kind of, you know, metals in them that they take up which can also vary by where it's grown. So that's another thing. If you're, if you're doing like phytoremediation on an old mine site, you know, trying to take up, I don't know, mercury or zinc or something, I don't know. And then you burn that, you, you might end up with toxic levels of heavy metals in your jar. So, you know, that's another consideration. And then rice hulls, crop waste is usually straws and, Holes and things, things like that are usually quite different. They'll have much higher ash content. Um, rice holes are particularly interesting because they are they have a lot of silica. And if you char those at high temperature, you can actually get some little, um, they call them cristobalites, little crystals of silica that are like glass. And those can be dangerous to breathe. So like I'm almost like asbestos. So rice holes, you need to be careful with. But on the other hand, they're very easy to char because each rice hole is surrounded by this little silica envelope. So it's, it's like a mini retort. <laughs> so, you know, the, the carbon inside 
um, charge really easily because it's protected from the air by the, the silica shell. Um, and their carbonized rice hulls are used a lot in Asia. Do you think that, you know, you work with what you have, that's always kind of the best choice. You're in forest country. There's a lot of brush and wood around you to burn mm -hmm. for somebody who has a lot of ag waste. Do you think that they're in terms of the soil, do you think they're equal one for one? Like if you had your pick and really sourcing wasn't a, a factor and they were two piles in front of you, a pile of rice hull biochar, a pile of biochar from made from woody debris. Is there one you would lean towards just given your experience? Well, what are you growing? Let's say we're just growing vegetables. Um, you know, I just don't have any experience with crop waste, so I, I can't give you any direct experience. I do know a lot of researchers feel like straw and, right, and, you know, crop waste chars are better. Will give you more of a fertilizer effect, in other words, because you do have more ash. Ash and those minerals are nutrients. If you are, so for instance, I've tried to, uh, you know, mentioned this to a few of the cannabis growers that I know around here because we're a hot spot for that, that, you know, they're spending all this money on inputs. And then at the end of the season, they have all these hemp stocks and a lot of them just burn them, get rid of them, take them away. They don't know what they're doing. <laughs> like, you know, you should at least compost them. And um, if you make them into char, you know, you're – that plant took up all those inputs you paid for and at least the mineral ones are still going to be there. So, you know, you can recycle them back into the soil. So, you know, if you're growing a, um, a monocrop every year, um, why not, you know, conserve your, your minerals that can be conserved in the char rather than buying them again. Yeah. And, and thinking of ash content. So, when you make the char, you can somewhat, I think, control how much ash is left on there by how much you rinse it in the quench process. Can you talk a little bit about the importance of quenching biochar and its effect on the pores in the char and the rinsing of ash off of the char? Well, it, then again, it really depends on your purpose and where you are, what your soils need. Um, here in, in a forested region on the, you know, on the Pacific coast, our soils tend to be acidic because we get a lot of rain, right? Which makes for more acid soils. So ash is not a problem, you know, um, I don't I'm worry about it, trying to rinse it at all, especially since I'm putting it in the compost first. However, where you, where you have alkaline soils, you need to be very careful because it has a liming impact right and if your soil is already ph 8 and you add a ph 9 biochar with ash in it um you're not going to be happy with the results um so that's again another reason to compost it first because the ph will neutralize after the after the composting um you know because the microbes live in there they deposit organic acids the organic acids also now create anion exchange capacity. Char is like a little seed for humus. And that's how you should use it mm -hmm. is to, to grow humus and then put it in the soil. That's what I think. Um, so rinsing, not rinsing, you know, if you, if you are in a, you know, in, in Eastern Oregon or in the desert, you know, where soils are alkaline, yes, you probably want to try and rinse it if you can first um, and then put it in your compost because your compost might be a bit alkaline too. You can use, uh, and you can use other um, organics, you know, to, to bring the fertilizer, to bring the pH down. Well, knowing that, and knowing that there's a lot of different methods that people could be making biochar, including people getting it from biomass plants, there's a lot of companies selling biochar now. And it's one of those things. People hear biochar, they see it on the bag, they buy it. And I'm thinking, well, they're not all created equal. If you're purchasing biochar from company X, 
Are there questions you think you should be asking or things you should be looking for when you buy them to ensure that you're getting something that's maybe a, a higher quality or better? Yeah, you should ask for that fractional analysis. What's the car percentage of stable carbon? What's the per percentage of degradable carbon or labile carbon? What's the percentage of ash? What is the feedstock? Is it made from wood? Is it, you know? Um, and ask about the process. Ask about the temperature that it's made at. Although, you know, if you know the fractional analysis, you have a pretty good idea of that. So you want to know what it's made from and what's the fractional analysis. And those are the main things you need to know. Um, if you can get information on surface area, that's good too. So, you know, the other thing is that biochar is, uh, or charcoal, charred organic matter is a continuum of stuff. You know, I've already talked about the fuel charcoal at low temperature. And then, you you know, you got the high temperature chars that are more, more porous and um, more pure carbon. But then over here, you now get into these engineer materials like activated carbons. So activated carbons are used in filtration. And there's a whole activated carbon industry. And there's all kinds of properties. These things can be tuned to absorb specific chemicals or metals. And um, that's a very active area of biochar research, actually, is because those markets actually um, exist. <laughs> you know, they're, they've been around for a while. They're very ro robust markets. A lot, there's a lot of it sold, you know, whether it's for filtering water in your aquarium or fish tank or whether it's, you know, a water treatment plant is filtering drinking water for a city. Um, activated carbons are a big market. And some of these biochars are, they're finding our work really almost as well sometimes better than some of the engineered carbons, which are usually made from coal. Um, so that's a whole nother area of biochar research. And um, it's, it's on the, kind of further on that spectrum. Yeah. For, for people that are interested in adding biochar to their soil, I think one of the best ways to do it is to get out there and make it from a simple pit kiln that you can just dig in the soil to some of the more, I'll call them advanced, although they're not, super complex. It's not like building a computer of the, like the fire cap kiln that you have cone kilns, pyramid kilns, that Oregon kiln. You have plans for all that on wilsonbiochar.com. What do you think is a, is a great way for a beginner to start out if they want to make some biochar? They maybe don't have great fabrication skills. They don't want to dump a bunch of money in it right away because they're not sure if they're going to be into this. How would you advise people start? Um, you know, the easiest, quickest way to make a lot of biochar is to have some small brush. So, uh, you know, whatever's growing around that's a problem for you, that's just small brush that most of the stems are about the size, you no know, thicker than your pinky, you know, maybe basically finger size stuff and smaller. And you could take, if you have some old um, roofing steel, just lay it out on the ground and make a surface, a metal surface, pile your brush on that and kind of compress it. Can't be too loose. So compress it down as much as you can, light it on top, let it burn down until it's at that glowing coal stage and it's just starting to ash, and then put it out with water. It goes quick, because it's small. And when you put it on that metal, um, platform, you know, the, underneath it, that reflects the heat back. So it's much more efficient. And then it goes out easily. And then it's on sitting on these metal sheets, and you can scoop it up easily. It's already a pretty small particle size. So you don't really have to do much to crush it up, although you can crush it further if you want. Um, that's the easiest way I found to make a lot of biochar quickly with very little trouble. And if you don't have metal sheets, just do it on the ground, you know. Um, but basically just a toplet burn pile. If you want to do a shallow pit, it doesn't need to be a big pit. Just even a little shallow pit um, will help. But the, the key thing is the feedstock, small brush. Another way you could do it if you don't have much, you just want to play around with it. Maybe you don't, you know, don't have 
the ability to burn a pile because you're, you know, in town or, you know, in the suburbs, um, you've got a, bar, a kettle grill. You have a kettle grill in your backyard on your deck. You can make biochar. So you just cut off the, you know, this would be for a charcoal grill, not a gas grill. But you, you, you close the air holes in the bottom. You get some little wood chunks, little sticks, make a little kind of open rick, light it on top, let it burn down. Um, if you want, you've got time to, you know, quickly cook a hot dog or a shish kebab or something <laughs> while well, it's in the charcoal stage. And then you can either put it out with water or you can dump it in a, a metal can with a lid and snuff it that way. So you can make a small amount of biochar like that. You can make it every time you, you cook. You know, you don't have to buy a charcoal. You can um, just make it and use it and then save some of it for the soil. Burning from the top versus burning from the bottom. Most of these vessels, you know, there's some sort of shape. And they're the, in a traditional fire, if you're going to start a campfire, you know, you're building your fire down here and then you're adding wood and it's potentially building up here. If you look at some of the diagrams on sites like yours, you have this vessel, it's empty. We're going to fill it with dry brush. We're going to light it up here. It's going to burn mm -hmm. its way down, creates an ash and a flame cap at the top. Then we're going to start adding our, our new material to that once that's all burned. Right. What's the significance of burning from the top? Why that and why not start at the bottom, get a fire going and layer up? This is quicker. I mean, you, 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 um, and I used to do it that way where I put a small fire in the kiln and it would just take a long time to build up the heat, take a whole extra hour. So by making them a kind of loose rick, and if you make it too big, you won't be able, it won't burn all the way down. So, um, you know, I, lots of times I've ended up with some unburned stuff in the bottom, but that's not a problem. But still, you know, if you kind of fill it fairly full um, with smaller stuff, it will, the, the, you know, it starts doing that thing where it sucks air from the top. Where in making biochar, where do you think people make mistakes? Where are they getting it wrong? You, you teach a lot of workshops. You've seen a lot of this. Are, are there common things people do wrong on the production side? So not, not inoculating it, not, not composting it first, but on the production side. Well, I think we're all learning, you know, and everybody has different feedstocks. Um, I think the main thing that's going to give you better results is to make sure your, your, your biomass is dry um, and not too big. So, you know, I see people trying to put a, push a big log into a kiln and it's, you know, it, it, it doesn't sustain the, a big wet log won't sustain the flame. If it burns at all, it'll smolder. Um, from a fuel standpoint, you know, fuel reduction standpoint, you know, where we're just trying, we're out in the forest and we've got, you know, yard, you know, just piles and piles of brush that we just have to treat and deal with. Um, people will put big logs in those piles and there's no need from a fuel standpoint to try to burn a, a you know, an eight inch diameter log because it's not a fuel danger. It's the small brush. It's the limbs. Those are the things we want to burn. So keep it small and keep it dry and, and you should be successful. And always keep a flame on top because if you start loading it too fast, the flame will die down. It'll start getting smoke. So as soon as you get smoke, hold off, you know, let the flame come back up. So in a perfect burn, I mean, this is one concern people have that aren't knowledgeable about it. They're like, you're, you're putting all that smoke and articulated into the air, but in a efficient, clean burn, there is no to minimal smoke and there is no particulate because it's all being burned off. Um, so yes, in a, a perfect burn, um, you would always keep a strong flame on top. You would have a windscreen, which I've found makes a big difference. I have a new kiln design I'm calling the Deluxe Ring of Fire. We just uh, started producing those this spring. And we tested them out with, um, we had a bunch of high school kids who were home uh, from school with nothing to do. So we went around and we just, in our neighborhood, and we just um, charred all the neighbors' burnt piles. And uh, so it was a great service for them. 
And this new kiln, you know, uh, it's, it's got an extra screen around it. So it's a ring of fire with an extra windscreen. And it really dramatically improves the efficiency and the, and the um, emissions, at least visually, uh, because you got a preheated air coming up in the annular space between the two rings. And that preheated air helps feed the, uh, the flame. And um, so and it's a little taller as opposed to the Oregon kiln. And so the, the fire kind of stays down in the hole. And, <laughs> and so, you know, this, the smoke really burns a lot better. And I'm really liking the way this kiln is working. That's cool. People can see pics of that on the website. Let's say now we're done burning. What are your thoughts on reducing particle size at the end? You're going to have chunky stuff. You're going to have finer stuff. Do you think it's important? People obsess on this. It needs to be powderish. It needs to look like rice. It, it can't look like, you know, bigger things like dog food. What are your thoughts on particle size? <laughs> well, you know, um, finer biochar is, has more immediate impact because, um, you know, if you're a microbe, even a tiny little powder piece of char is really big, right? So, um, you know, it just it gives you the microbes more access. But char can do different things. You know, it, it's not just home for microbes. It also holds water and air. And it's, um, you know, can help loosen soil, give it a better tilt. Uh, I like to put chunks of biochar in the bottom of uh, pots, you know, of um, potted plants for drainage and uh, just uh, actually to hold water and allow water to drain. It kind of does both things, but keeping the right water, a moisture level and air so your pots don't get anaerobic. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm my garden, I have some chunks. And I have some vines, uh, a variety of particle sizes, perfectly good. Yeah. So knowing that, the other thing is dosage or rate of application. Do you think that there's an amount people should look at to start with if, you know, not go overboard that whatever, 10 tons per hectare? Uh, but you also want enough to potentially see some sort of result. Where do you think that middle ground is to say, I I'm serious enough to give this a shot. I'm going to do enough to put it there to to make an impact, but you know, we're not going overboard. It depends on so much on your soil, okay? It really does. But you know, when I'm doing um, veggie starch or making a potting soil mix, I I'm depending on how much other stuff is in the soil mix, like how much other fertilizer, I might put 20% char. That would be a lot. Get results with less. And the, the critical thing is compost. Um, it's really interesting that you could see a big difference, and I've done a lot of compost experiments, between 5 and 10% char. You know, whereas five um, percent might uh, make a compost pile really heat up, ten percent might cool it down a little bit. In the end, you still get great compost, but you can really see it's like it's like an air fuel mixture in a carburetor. You know, you can get the mixture rich or lean, and it has different impacts on the engine. Yes, yeah, so again, it invokes the citizen scientists to do their own work to try things. You've done a lot of, of work promoting and, and helping people learn more about biochar. Wilsonbiochar.com is your website. You have plans there for kilns. You have a lot of great information. You do workshops. Uh, beyond that, is there any place else people you think can go to learn more, either other places that you're connected with or just other great resources out there about all things biochar? Yeah, yeah. Um... Yeah, please do go to my website. I do have a lot of free ebooks. I also have a what I call the biochar cookbook, which uh, is uh, my own personal tips and tricks for using biochar. Um, and the other place I would send people would be the U.S. Biochar Initiative. So it's um, U.S. Biochar, uh, USBI. Um, 
I am not remembering the website URL right now. I think it's usbiochar.org. I can't remember. Anyway, I'm on the board of that organization. We've been around for about 10 years. We've been the, the group that's organized the biochar conferences in the U.S. Every couple of years we have a biochar conference. We had one in Colorado last year. And uh, we're kind of gearing up right now, um, starting to get a little more funding. And uh, one of my projects as a board member is going to be to work on our educational resources. Because for the industry, the people are actually trying to make a living being providers of biochar. They're running into all these things that you're talking about where people are very confused. There's some bad information out or incorrect information about their out there that people are picking up on and and there's just very little guidance um actually there are a lot of good resources but they're scattered and you you know if you're new to it you have no idea what's good and what's not so what we're going to be doing is curating that so we'll be looking at a lot of the stuff that's out there and um picking out the stuff that's really good and helpful and putting it on the website and that should be that should help ultimately build markets for the biochar suppliers. So, you know, you can't put it in the ground if you can't buy it, if, you know, um, um, unless you can make it yourself, which of course you hear a lot of our permaculture this can do. But even if you're making it yourself, you still need guidance on how to use it. Hi, everybody. Thanks for watching. Subscribe here to get the latest from the show. Also, be sure to check out some of the great clips and watch the full interviews right here on In Search of Soil.